everybody, and welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where we talk to all different types of experts, athletes, and people who are living a lifestyle where they explore all different types of movement and adventure. I'm Molly Herford. I have been writing about all things outdoors, fitness, and crazy adventure related for the last decade and, you know, attempting to do a fair, fair amount of it. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm a registered kinesiologist and an endurance coach. Um, and I just got back racing my mountain bike this past weekend at the Paris Dancaster, which was great. I had missed racing and was pretty amped up to get back out there and it was a good time. I was pretty jealous. I'm not going to lie. You guys had a really nice day for it. It's one of my favorite races to do in Canada. So it's always a bummer missing that. But yoga teacher training is going pretty well. So I can't complain too much. I finally learned how to do a crow with a one leg out in the air behind you, which sounds kind of weird if you don't know what crow looks like. So look it up, I guess, if you're curious. Uh, but yeah, it's been going really well and not just It's in the... sort of like a headstand. Yeah. You, don't put, you just don't put your head on the ground. It's probably the easiest way to visualize it, I guess. Like, isn't that a handstand? Uh, but think, like, imagine you were in a headstand and then somehow you lifted your head off. That's not really how you get into it, but that's essentially the position. I guess. Okay, fair enough. Uh, anyway... Yoga teacher training has been going well. Our weather has been getting nicer. We actually got out on a group run at night one night this week in the rain, oddly enough. Um, That was a pretty good consummate athlete adventure. I think we're finally starting to really embrace all of the, you know, options and people that Collingwood has to offer and, you know, getting out and making new friends and trying out new things. Yeah. Yeah, it's been good doing that. And then I've been back in the gym, so get exposed to lots of different movement and stuff. We do a lot of, I think I've mentioned before, volleyball with the the young sort of athletes and stuff. A lot of time we'll do that as a warm-up. So I've never been great at volleyball and I've sort of noticed my my skills improving a little bit. So that's that's been quite enjoyable. Nice. Uh, and then just a couple of notes. If you happen to be in New York City and want to come out and hear me talk all things training, nutrition, cycling, comfort, basically, if you have a question about bike stuff, I can probably answer it. Uh, I'll be speaking at the Rafa Cycle Club in downtown New York this Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, and then if you are a female in the greater Toronto area, I will be speaking in Barrie, Ontario at the Trek store on Monday at 7 p.m. Just a nice ladies talk about kind of all things ride comfort. So that should be a super fun one as well. So, yeah, lots of talks coming up. I'm excited. That sounds awesome. Yeah, and I'm just mostly on trail with folks and working in the gym and mostly just small groups and stuff. But we have a couple bigger clinics, although a bunch of them we're in Saskatchewan and we have one in Collingwood, but I think they're, they're doing okay. We have one actually, I guess the Collingwood one still has some openings, but um, yeah, mostly small group stuff on the bikes right now. So it's all good. Did the Ellen Noble quest fill up? Uh, not quite. I think we still have like two slots left, but they're so probably going to go. If you, if you are, or you care for, or I don't know, you, you t- take, young girls to bike races i don't know i always go down a bad path with this if, if you know a young lady who likes to race cyclocross bikes or is interested in racing them um this is sort of a 14 to 18 is our yep yep 14, 14 to, 18. to 18 you can find so out you, more just at ellennoble.com we'll leave yeah, it at that <laughs> yeah probably good anyway today's guest is mia manginello she is an olympic bronze medalist Uh, in speed skating actually but she also was a professional bike racer for quite a few years but she also she started with roller skating inline skating inline skating so this is like and that was big that was like 90s 80s 90s maybe the the, like yeah technology came out and then they added lots of wheels and the skates got long and the speeds got high yeah i feel like that's how a documentary would start uh you need a better documentary voice and then the speeds got high. That actually sounded like the intro to that HBO mockumentary tour to pharmacy about bike racing. Well, I think they're trying to show that here in town, actually. Really? 
Sweet. Good to know. Anyway, um, Mia was awesome. I had actually interviewed her for Flow Bikes. Um, you can uh, you can find the interview on uh, just on the outdooredit.com. I have a link to it. And I loved her so much talking about kind of where she'd been, how she got into speed skating, how she got into bike racing, and all, you know, how her training has changed over the years, how it evolved to work with bike racing, how the two sports influenced each other. Uh, her parents are both chefs, so we also get pretty heavy into how she eats and, you know, some of her favorite things to eat. Uh, we actually, in the written interview, you can find one of her favorite recipes, uh, and we kind of get into that in our talk, too. But she was just so rad when I first interviewed her that I knew we wanted to have her on the show. So, yeah, this was a great chance for me to get to kind of re-dive into some stuff that I covered in the interview, but then also get into the stuff that I thought was super interesting that I hadn't gotten a chance to delve into too deep. Awesome. Well, why don't we check it out? Now that it's been like a month since I last talked to you, have, has it started to sink in that you have an Olympic medal? <laughs> um, gosh, I hate saying it, but no, not really. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, I went a couple weeks there without looking at it. It was just in my person uh, hanging here at the house. And and I went to uh, meet a couple friends at a local coffee shop. And, and it was the first time I had seen it in a little while. And it kind of caught me by surprise again. <laughs> and it's just like, holy crap, this thing is real. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, so I'm really excited for the day that I have a place for it, mm -hmm. so I can set it out and and see uh, and see it every day. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and just kind of remind myself. You know, I mean, selfishly, it's it's good to see what you've accomplished on bad days. Mm -hmm. You know, you're feeling crummy about yourself, or or you know, just feeling down. And you can just kind of glance over and be like, oh, yeah, I was a badass. <laughs> oh, right. That's my Olympic medal, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've done something. That's yeah. cool. <laughs> That's so rad. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's just let's just dive in here. Um, I know, obviously, sure. we've we've talked before, but for, you know, the listeners who, you know, maybe know your name because I've been, you know, writing about it a bunch, but give me your like <laughs> brief bio. Okay. So Mia Manganiello, uh, I'm 28 years old. I started skating pretty much at two in diapers uh, on roller <laughs> skates. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, both my parents were in the skating world, um, both competitively more so my dad uh, once I was about mid, I don't know, five or six, my dad had quit, uh, and they focused on business and making money. And, um, and I just continued rolling at the rink. I, I went to the skating rink probably five days a week. Um, and all under the age of 10, <laughs> which is just <laughs> mind blowing to look back at. <laughs> yeah. For like a 10 year old you know, to have that kind of young. drive. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It's nuts. Um, when I was 13 years old, I decided I wanted to try ice skating. Um, it was after my dad had brought me out to Salt Lake City. We were in Florida. Um, he had brought me out to Salt Lake City for just kind of a, a long weekend uh, learn to speed skate camp. And it was myself and probably about 20 other kids, uh, some adults as well. And um and I just had an absolute blast. I'm not sure if it was, you know, just the internal love for this this sport or if it's if it was a new challenge, new exciting, you know, something to to better myself at. Mm -hmm. um, but I left completely motivated to be an ice speed skater, go to the Olympics and win a medal. <laughs> Um, and so my dad and I had driven out to Salt Lake for the camp. So on our way back, uh, we called my mom, uh, dad was like, yeah, you know, 
joke her out, play a joke on her, and, and tell her you want to move out here. And uh, <laughs> so I did, jokingly, of course. Kind of serious, but jokingly. Yeah. Um, we get back after the two-day drive, and Mom has the whole living room packed, part of the kitchen. Oh, my God. And it happened. <laughs> yeah. About a month later, we packed up our RV uh, and drove out to Salt Lake City. Um, I started skating the moment we got here. Uh, I joined a local club, just a learn to speed skate club, uh, here at the Utah Olympic Oval. Uh, it's a little step program, which keeps you motivated and progressing quickly. Um, I competed up until I was 20 years old. I made numerous junior world teams, world cup teams, world championship teams. Uh, pretty much accomplishing every goal but making the Olympics. I, uh, I then, at the age of 20, 1920, uh, competed at the 2010 Olympic trials here in Salt Lake. And leading into it, uh, the previous year, I had all the motivation in the world um, and, you know, huge hopes in making that team. Uh, the year of 2010, my coach was let go. And so I, was, I found myself a bit lost, um, looking for new coaching, looking for a new program, while also maintaining focus. And for me at that age, looking back, I, I just wasn't mentally prepared to handle a situation like that. So needless to say, the Olympic trials did not go as planned. Uh, I didn't, yeah, I didn't perform up to my, my potential. Uh, I knew it, but at that moment I was a stubborn, almost 20 year old. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I, I had devoted my life to this, uh, and for it to end that way, I was just kind of over it. I, uh, I was mentally burnt out, you know, Mm -hmm. um, physically I I wasn't capable of doing much more in that time of my life. Uh, So I decided to step away. I stepped away uh, for six years. Within that six years, I took up uh, professional cycling. Um, I was on a team for five years and grew to become one of the best sprinters in the country, uh, winning green jerseys, which are the sprinters jerseys and Mm -hmm. stage racing. Um, I love, I absolutely fell in love with the team atmosphere of cycling. Uh, Growing up as a speed skater, it's an individual sport. And so, yeah, it took me probably a good year, year and a half to get the mindset of working as a team, (laughs) which is, Pretty aggravating for my director, I guarantee you. Um, <laughs> it's a weird thing to get used she... to. Oh, absolutely. Well, and it's just like, why does she get to win? I want to win. Yeah. You know, why? And I'm just, ugh, I was ridiculous. But once you get, once you get over that, it's the most rewarding feeling I've ever felt was completely killing myself and going so far into the hole for your teammate to succeed. Mm-hmm. Um, there is, you know, a fine line. You want to make sure that, you know, that person is being, uh, you know, credited for that effort. And, you know, the people surrounding me did just that. And so for me, yeah, it was a, it was an extreme reward. Um, and something I definitely miss to this day right now coming back. Uh, mm. So after the six years away, I decided, you know, I never stopped thinking about speed skating uh, and my lack of achieving this Olympic dream that I've had since I was 13 years old. And so two years ago, I decided to come out and just kind of jump in the ice, dabble in a little bit, um, just kind of see if it's still there. And I stepped on the ice and... I'm telling you, it was magic. <laughs> it was it was the most surreal feeling 
I, I stepped on the ice. The technique was a little rusty, but pretty much still solid. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but coming off the bike, I was in the best physical shape I had ever been in in my life. Um, you know, I had leaned out and my endurance was through the roof. Mm-hmm. And so I could just go out there and I could just skate laps and laps and laps. And for me, you know, I'm a purist when it comes to speed skating and, and that is speed skating. You know, it's just the, the capability of just going out and enjoying each corner, each straightaway and just doing it over and over again and just finding your rhythm and just losing yourself in it. And that's really what, what just kind of rushed back to me. And I'm like, okay, this is it. It's now or never, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's time to, to finish old business, uh, and take care of old business. Um, and so I competed in my last season of cycling, uh, in 2016, jumped right onto the ice that fall uh had the most amazing season ever and then uh, decided this past summer to not go back to road cycling um i still trained with it full blown um but i just didn't want to take the risk of of crashing or injuring myself yeah uh so i focused more on the ice and speed skating specific training um and looking back, I would have changed a couple of things training wise. Uh, there's nothing like the fitness you get from actually racing your bike. Uh, you can, you can train all you want, but the, yeah, just the fitness you get from a stage race or even a freaking crit is, you know, it's unmeasurable and, and you can't compare anything to it. And so that was, I don't want to say a regret, but something I, I would have changed about this past season. Um, I probably would have raced and just been a little bit more cautious mm-hmm. on the descents or something. Um, but needless to say, it all worked out. Mm-hmm. Made the Olympic team. And uh, and now I'm an Olympic medalist, which is totally so my Okay. First of all, what was the what was the trials like this time compared to when you did them eight years ago? Were you like super uh, nervous because it hadn't gone super well the first time? Yeah. Um, well, leading into the Olympics trials, um, the previous year I was the best in the country um, by a pretty good margin. So going into this year, I was pretty confident in myself. I knew, you know. I could only get better. Mm-hmm. Um, if anything, I just maintain and and things should go fairly well. And uh, but my training kind of wasn't to the uh, the high quality that I I wanted. And uh, so going into Olympic trials, I was a bit nervous. Uh, I knew that I wasn't skating my best. Um, I had been really, really sick two weeks prior, so I wasn't able to get a good training block leading into the Olympic trials. Um, but I knew, I knew I would make it. I just didn't know in what event, Mm -hmm. uh, I would make it in. Um, but so the 3000 meter was the first event, my favorite race. Uh, and I was just my body didn't have anything to produce pretty much. You know, I was going out there, you know? Yeah. Um, And so I went out, uh, obviously skated the best I could and it wasn't good enough that day. So first day down, not an Olympian yet. Um, Second day was the thousand meter. This race is, so the 3000 is my heart. But the thousand is just absolute fun. <laughs> this race is the best race ever. <laughs> it is so much fun. Because once you start hurting, you're done. I mean, it's the perfect distance. It's uh, a little over a minute okay. of a race. 
Yeah, and it's just full blow. It's two and a half laps, mm-hmm. and that's it. You just go. You just go from the gun. You go hard, and it's a blast. Um, so this uh, this race I wanted to do just for fun. Uh, I knew I had a chance to make the team, but um, it wasn't a goal of mine. Mm-hmm. So since the three thousand didn't go as planned, I'm like, okay, screw this. I'm going to have some fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I raced a thousand. Um, and I actually got third, which was a qualifying spot for the Olympic team. Um, but there was a time standard that the U S speed skating organization had put forth that I did not achieve. Um, this being very difficult to achieve on slow sea level ice. Uh, so it was kind of, it was a frustrating situation. But, um, once again, they too didn't make the Olympic team. Uh, now it is day three, which is the 5,000 meter. And this race, I'm sure I could be pretty darn good at, but I just can't stand it. (laughs) It's 12 and a half laps. And I, I just lose my mind in this race. I get so bored. <laughs> I don't know. It's just terrible. It's just terrible. I'm talking about how pure, you know, skating laps is, but when you go out and you put this time frame on it, mm-hmm. you know, it just throws all that pretty at the window. Uh, so I decided to not race the 5,000, rest a day, uh, excuse me, rest two days, because the next day I wouldn't race either, and put all my eggs in the 1,500-meter basket. Um, so I rested that day, then the following, and then, uh, we're looking at two days left of Olympic trials and I'm not an Olympian yet. Uh, I go to the line over 1500. I'm the last pair. I know exactly the time I need to beat, um, which is pretty much the most perfect situation you could ever imagine. And, uh, when I when I crossed that line and all I saw was it was sub two minutes, which is what I needed to do to make the team. I didn't see anything else. I threw my hands up, started screaming. Uh, <laughs> but it was it was the most surreal. But it was the most surreal moment. But it was so interesting because it's a moment that I knew I was capable of and had envisioned. And, you know, experienced over and over again in my mind. Mm -hmm. But when it actually happens, you know, and you see your coach and you see your family and like, I mean, it makes me emotional just thinking about it again. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't simulate that in your mind. You can't prepare yourself for that feeling, Uh, especially for a first time Olympian, you know, and uh, so, yeah, it was. It was not an easy Olympic trials by any means. It was the most stressful thing. I tried to keep myself calm. My family were amazing. Uh, My fiance was amazing. (laughs) Trying to just, you know, it'll be okay. We'll get through this, you know. Yeah. (laughs) uh, Yeah. So it was a complete head case. It was awful. But uh, but I knew I knew I would make it somehow I just didn't know in what way yeah um and then the next day was the mass start which I knew I had no no issues making um and that was just a ball of fun that was just awesome wait mass start so what does that mean yes so (laughs) the mass start is pretty much a crit on ice holy crap yeah um unfortunately we don't have a hundred of us out there but (laughs) (laughs) it's uh so at the olympics they um they took it to 16 girls and 16 guys in the final um so within this race it's 16 laps you have three preems um those are for points and then you have the final sprint which only top three get points So there's a bit of strategy Uh, at the Olympics. They had a 
semifinal and then a final. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when we went to the semifinal, um, it's top eight moved on to the final, but top eight in points, not top eight finishing at the line oh, okay. after the team laps. So the preems are extremely important uh, because if if you get, I think we calculated it out, if you were able to get three or four points, you're pretty much guaranteed a spot in the final. And so you're out there and you're with, you know, up to 20 girls fighting for eight spots. Whew. And it, yeah. And we're going for every preem, which is pretty much, I think it's maybe every three laps, every four laps. And so it's just full-blown. There's no way to attack. It's just go, go, go. And it was <laughs> so stressful in my semi uh, because I had a game plan, and it just kept getting screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, well, crap. That one didn't work. Got to go for the next one. That one didn't work. Got to go for So luckily I was able to get one point. And thank God that was enough to get me to the final. Um, I believe I was the last person. I was the eighth person in that semi. Um, so luckily it, wor- it worked out. Um, that way we could, as Team USA, move forward with our strategy going to the final. Um, and so in the final, it was the 16 girls and with the points that you can accumulate during the race, even if you were to win all three, you still, that still won't put you on the podium, uh, because the points they have for the finish line are out of reach and it only goes to top three. Okay. So, so in the final, it's kind of doesn't make sense to go for the semis or excuse me for the preems it's just kind of a waste of time and a waste of energy so the race really comes down to about the last three laps um so for our for our game plan uh we had myself and heather richardson who is one of the fastest women in the world um we had a game plan of i would lead her out and she would finish it off with an awesome sprint. It's um, so funny how much it, this sounds like you're just talking about a crit in bike racing. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's really interesting how um, a lot of people don't understand it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for us, it's second nature. Yeah, you know? exactly. You're, I'm like, oh, of course. Like, down, you're... <laughs> you know, you're attacking. Yeah. But I'm trying to talk to these people, and they're just, uh-huh. Uh huh. Okay. You know, and I was like, are you getting it? Are you getting it? I don't know if you're getting it. You know, and like, we're going to have to be able to adjust last minute, you know, and we need to communicate. And we're just like, okay, we're just going to have you lead her out at this lap, and she's going to do her best to get on the podium. I'm like, okay, done. Got it. <laughs> Can do. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, it, was an, it was an amazing final set it up perfectly um we just kind of chilled out in the back waited for the right moment uh, it was right after the last preem uh is when i kind of countered with our uh with our build into the lead out and uh and so i led the last three and a half laps and pulled off uh with one to go and unfortunately she didn't uh, have the legs that day to finish it off, but uh, <laughs> but I was pretty proud with with my effort and uh, and the possibilities that could be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's a, it's a thrilling, extremely spectator friendly uh, event that they brought to the to the game um, for long track speed skating, and uh, yeah, I'm ex- I'm excited to see its growth. Um, this was the first time it was in the Olympics and they've been racing it at world cups for the past few years, but definitely has a lot to develop, um, with the adjustment of points systems. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're out, if you're on a break, 
and you win all the preems, you should at least get third. Yeah. In on the you know what I mean? Like that effort should be rewarded. Yeah, um, if they're gonna make the preems count. Well, like, why not? Have exactly. Fun? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Otherwise, everybody's just waiting for the last lap, and they just wait and sprint. Yeah. And what kind of race is that? You yeah. know. So. Uh, so yeah. So there's a little a little bit of tweaks that can be made, and I'm sure they will. It'll develop, and uh, and it's an amazing event. And it was fun to kind of bring my my love of cycling into the love of speed skating as well. That's awesome. So in this, I have to ask, does it ever get like crits where like people are like bumping elbows and like, dude, <laughs> it is hardcore. <laughs> it is so dirty. These girls, I mean, we always talk with the guys on our team that do it as well. And they're just completely shocked <laughs> by how dirty these girls are and we think it's because our pace isn't as high so we're not strung out so there's more opportunities to bump and grab and pull and yank Mm. (laughs) and so in that yeah i mean it is unreal in the final at the olympics our first lap it's it's pretty much a roll start so we uh our first lap, the gun goes off, and it's neutral. So the idea is just everybody kind of form a line, and then next time we come around, they'll shoot the gun again, and the, the race starts. Okay. So within that neutral lap, nothing's supposed to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, placement doesn't really matter. You got 16 more laps. You know, oh, my God. <laughs> that gun goes off, and... There are arms and hands everywhere. I mean, people are grabbing hips, yanking them back, cool. bumping. Oh, it is nuts. And oh. so I'm in the back, and, like, I don't even see it in the video, but <laughs> I just, like, throw my hands up. And I'm like, oh, my God, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't care. <laughs> Please don't hurt me. Please don't hurt me. Seriously. <laughs> I mean, we got blades on our feet right here, you know? Calm yeah. down. Oh, that's so funny. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely, it's it's way more than cycling because cycling, you can't use your hands yeah. well, most of the time. You can't use your hands. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. It is. It takes a certain kind of person that, that can get out there and, and be okay with that, be comfortable with the touchy. Mm-hmm. Um, I know a lot of girls that have tried – and, you know, once they're touched, you know, they lose three spots mm-hmm. kind of a thing. And so, yeah, it's it's definitely going to bring out a certain type of of athlete. Yeah, uh, for sure. But hopefully that, that grows the sport, you know, gives a new opportunity to somebody else that doesn't like time trial yeah. um, speed skating, which is all long track is, mm-hmm. and kind of just plays, a, yeah, plays in a different person, so... Yeah, for it's sure. exciting. Yeah. Okay, so that race. Now let's talk about the race where you actually walked away with a medal. So let give me the story. <laughs> yeah. So the team pursuit is uh, probably my favorite race. Uh, obviously, opposed, you know, not uh, taken away from my individual races, but for me, coming off cycling, I'm a team team player Mm -hmm. and so this team pursuit is pretty much the same as uh in the velodrome so we have three girls or three guys um and we skate six laps men skate eight and your time is based off your third skater to cross the line Okay. So the whole idea is you have to keep everybody together and work as a unit. Mm-hmm. So in our situation, uh, we had two sprinters and myself, which is more middle to long distance. So for us, you know, we have to make sure that we pick the right strategy to work best with our abilities. 
And so for myself, I would have the most endurance out of the three of us, Mm -hmm. where the other two are the fastest girls in the world, Brittany Bo and Heather Richardson. And so our, our plan was to have them go out first and just go hard. They were our speed builders and maintain. So for myself, it was a little difficult. Uh, luckily, it doesn't show it in the replay, but I think it <laughs> dropped for the first 50 meters. <laughs> Just because they're so freaking fast. But uh, yeah, so we took off first two, three laps. Um, the other girls led and pretty much got us I mean, the metal, like without them uh, and building that speed, um, you know, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been possible. Um, we built up, I think almost a three minute or almost a four minute, a second, excuse me, uh, lead on the Canadians in our metal round. And, uh, and then luckily when I went to the lead, I was able to kind of keep it together <laughs> <laughs> and uh and get us to the line but it really is a full you know you can have many different types of skaters uh you know and and pick a strategy any any way any team can win pretty much you know it's, it's just really working to your best abilities and uh and trusting each other as a team and uh that was really something that drew me to this sport and and I always feel like if you're in a team atmosphere, you can always push yourself a little harder, mm-hmm. you know, opposed to being out there by yourself. Yeah. I knew I had my, my teammates behind me, you know, helping and, and we use pushing as well within the, within the race. And so I had them pushing and, and it just kind of gives you an extra couple levels mm-hmm. of, of intensity. And uh, yeah, it was, it's an amazing race. We we uh, didn't expect the result, but are damn pleased with it for sure. Yeah. So when you crossed the finish line, you still had to like wait to see where you'd end up, right? Well, so when we when we made it to the bronze medal round, uh, it's pretty much knockouts. Okay. So all so we knew all we needed to do was beat the Canadians. Mm. which was our pair. So it's a rat race, basically. Um, and so for us, when we crossed the line, all we needed to see was a one by our name, opposed to a two. Okay. And, uh, and so that's all I looked for. I think I was the first one to kind of look up, and, uh, and I'll, I didn't see our time. I didn't see anything but, uh, but that one by our name, by, by uh, USA. And we knew we did it. That's all we needed to know. It didn't matter how fast we went. We just had to beat the pair and and make it happen. Oh, did you totally freak out when you saw that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we were just hand... We couldn't feel anything in our body. <laughs> the quarter before, uh, myself and Brittany Bode, who was behind me, almost crashed. We almost fell, which... <laughs> just would have been the most devastating thing in the world and that all just kind of you just don't feel anything anymore you know Mm -hmm. you cross the line and it all disappears yeah and you just scream and you know it's crazy how your natural reaction is just to throw your hands up (laughs) but we did we all locked hands and threw our hands up and uh, and we wrapped around the the ice and all gave our coaches high fives on the other side. And Aww. it was, yeah, it was nuts. That's I couldn't, awesome. I couldn't believe it. And being the first team USA, uh, American team to win a medal in that event was a huge honor That's and a, so you know, a reward on top of it. Yeah. Um, we uh, we were the first women to get a medal since I think it had been 16 years. Oh wow! Since 
an American woman had won a medal on long track speed skating. Um, and in 2010, a period, an American medal, we had medaled in the sport. And so it, uh, there was many emotions going on and, and many things that just kept adding on. You know, we kept finding these, these little facts out, uh, along the way and it was yeah I just kept it surreal and and magical I love that okay yeah so backing way way up what does like a typical training week look like for you when you're like really heavy into speed skating season do you do any like flexibility stuff do you do any strength training is it all on the ice yeah what what's it look like yeah so pretty much the rundown um season starts about April, May. Um, this is our off season, quote, quote, <laughs> season. Um, yeah, this is where we're building our base. So from April, May till about August, uh, we're working on strength and conditioning. So I, we ride a lot. Cycling is probably the top, a cross training tool in speed skating, I'd say. Definitely for a middle to long distance athlete. Yeah. Um, and it's crazy also, how many pro cyclists are also speed skaters and vice versa. Right? Yeah, because we do it so much that we actually become pretty damn good at it. <laughs> you know? And then it's completely different and uh yeah, and just a new challenge and fun and but so we uh so we're on the bike. Uh, we also do a lot of weightlifting um, and skating-specific training as well. Uh, we call dry land. Um, so for the speed skating is a very, uh, you know, weight-bearing sport. You know, but you also need uh, power and strength on top of endurance. Mm-hmm. So. For me, specifically coming back, you know, I was coming off of six years of cycling. So I was very, you know, endurance was amazing, but I had no power behind me, right. even being a sprinter. Um, and so that was something that I needed to amp up a bit this year, um, because that's how you build speed mm-hmm. on, on the ice. Uh, and then come July, August, the long track oval, the ice is actually being made. So the ice isn't in year round, which is kind of a a reason we don't skate year round either, which is healthy. That way we can, we can build on other uh, aspects as well. Um, And so we get back on the ice, July, August. Uh, Then for the next couple months, we are kind of transitioning more to focusing on skating. Uh, we do a little bit less of cycling, a little bit less of weight, um, and try and get our hard workouts on the ice just to get your body used to that position mm-hmm. and uh, in skating at that effort. And then, uh, and then the season starts in October, and from there it's just kind of full throttle t- till about February. Um, so it's really important for us those first months in the summer, because that's, that's what you're building to sustain you till, till February. Yeah. You know, so it's really important. There's a couple moments in there that we have a couple weeks off that we aren't racing, uh, that you kind of try and do a little rebuild as well. You know, maybe get back on the bike throw in a couple weightlifting sessions, Mm -hmm. Um, but nothing really that can get you what you got in the summer. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, it's, it's a very, I don't know, I feel like it's a short season uh, because there's not that much racing, but, um, but it's very important to train for it. Um, And those, yeah, those first couple months is, is where it's built. I feel like that must be really challenging. I mean, I know cyclists run into this too, where like, you know, you know, you need to be training, but the race season seems so far away. 
like when it's April, you're like, oh, pff, I have forever. It's not going to be that big of a deal if I, you know, you know, skip this week or do this Black or do this. this. Day. Yeah. But like, yeah, it's absolutely. a huge thing. <laughs> it's a huge thing. And uh, this year for me, it came really quickly. It, it, April, I started trading in April, May, June. I, by June, I was like, oh, gosh. Just over it. I was over the bike. I was over weight. You know, I just wanted to skate. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm here. This is what I want to do. Um, but, but yeah, then after June, it, it was a moment. Yeah. <laughs> and then the Olympics were here, you know, and I'm like, holy crap, where did it all go? Did I train enough? Did yeah. I do this enough? You know, and, uh, so I definitely, yeah, I, I definitely try to maintain the mentality of just one day at a time, you know, accomplish mm -hmm. today, uh, don't look too far into the future, live in the moment, um, that way, yeah, things don't get too big, yeah. too out of hand, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so within the, the speed skating oval, um, I noticed this even in my like attempts to learn how to ice skate this year, because I'd never really done it before. Uh, you know, you're, you're yeah. kind of going in the one direction. So you're, you're sort of like tilted into the left all the time. Do you have, do you find Correct. you have to like reverse that with like some weight stuff or flexibility stuff or how do you handle that? Yeah. Well, our, our dry land workouts, uh, where we simulate skating on land. Uh, we do a lot in the opposite direction mm. just for that purpose. Yeah. Um, we are very left leg dominant just because that's our stability leg for half of our lap. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we need to make sure that, like you said, you know, balance it out basically. Um, so we do a lot of exercises in the opposite direction. Uh, we have trainers and physios that, go over with us um, kind of our balance and our strength and stretching just to maintain and, uh, and make sure that we are uniform. You know, we are consistent. Uh, we aren't drifting one way or the other because that can also develop into injuries. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we try to, they do a really great job uh, in trying to make sure that we are balanced and, uh, but in the end, I mean, we are only turning left, so it's it's inevitable. But <laughs> but you try and close that gap for sure. Yeah. Um, and what do you what do you think some mistakes that like new speed skaters make? What would some of the big ones be? Um, not being patient enough mm -hmm. to start from the bottom. Uh, so for me, I came over when I was 13. Like I said, I started in a learn to speed skate class. I started from the basics of the basics. Um, and from that, you can continue to grow and build in the correct direction. Mm -hmm. Uh, where some athletes come to the sport from either a different sport, a little older, so they feel, you know, obviously they're stronger and they're strong enough to skate. Um, so they kind of start out and then have to move backwards. Mm -hmm. um, so they start out a little too aggressively and with incorrect technique. And speed skating is all about technique. Yeah. You can have, you know, you can be the strongest person in the world. But if you can't transition that to the ice in a technical, in the correct technical way, you're not going to go anywhere. Yeah. And so technique is extremely important for us. And I think it's very important for any, anybody that's wanting to learn skating to, to start from the basics. Yeah. And for it's sure. going to suck because it's going to take time and you have to be patient. But in the long run, it will all be worth it. I like that. Are there any like great cues that you can think of that you kind of like remind yourself of when you're skating that someone that's kind of new to it could sort of be thinking of when they're on the ice? 
Yeah. Um, well, for me, uh, I, you know, I for skating, it's easy to get um, tense. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you're on these razor blade, you know, thin blades. Yeah. Um, and you're going around these corners. And so it's easy to kind of tense up. For me, I breathe. Um, every time I race, I had Craig, my fiance, yell at me to breathe. <laughs> uh, seriously, because you get wrapped up in the race. Yeah. And you've got all your race cues that you're thinking of that you forget. You know, breathing happens naturally, but not the correct breathing. Right. Um, so with skating, you know, it's a balance between, yes, you have to be tense to hold the position, but you need to be able to do it in a relaxed way. Um, and so breathing is a, is a huge factor, not only to skate well and, uh, and perform to your best, but, you know, it also helps with your muscles and your physiology, mm-hmm. too. Um, you know, so it can be a calming factor as well, especially in a longer race. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I mean a lot of it is just kind of technical cues. Um you know, you don't want to be too far on your heels. You want to make sure that you're centered on your blades, pushing with your butt. Uh, you know, just little things like that, but for an everyday use, breathing is is a huge one. I like that. It's funny you said the the pushing and using your butt because I think that's a problem a lot of cyclists have too is that they don't use their glutes, which are the biggest muscle that we can. Mm -hmm. And we Mm -hmm. all forget it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, cycling is an interesting sport in the sense of, you know, you have a coach. uh, Most of us have coaches, um, you know, that give you training workouts, but there's never, there's not really a lot of focus on technical no, definitely not for the for road. Cycling. It's crazy. You know? Yeah. And so it's, you know, yeah, you get your fitting and, you know, your foot placement on your cleat, make sure that this is all right and your legs are moving straight. And But there's not really any technical coaching, which yeah. I find interesting. But I know it's kind of difficult, too, because most coaches aren't seeing you every day either doing your workouts you know they're just mine was always remote um Mm -hmm. and so yeah I don't know I think that was one benefit that I brought to my cycling career though was a little bit of a more understanding of the body Mm -hmm. and uh and kind of knowing what works for me like I've used my glutes my entire life yeah why not use it on a bike (laughs) you know you're yeah. dying and your quads are blowing up. It's like, oh, wait, I've got this huge muscle back here. Right. Like, that too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. All right. So what's what's next for you? I mean, Olympic medal, you got four years till the next. Are you going to get back on the road? Oh, I know. What's... Four years is so long. Um, right now, I'm letting the ball roll. Um, I definitely miss cycling uh and being out on the road in a peloton uh surrounded by teammates so i'm pretty sure i'm gonna get back out there Mm -hmm. uh what time frame i don't know maybe next summer uh kind of miss this one being you know dealing with all these award shows banquets so tough (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but I mean, even right now, you know, this, this past couple of weeks I've been on the bike and I just like how I, I feel when I ride, mm-hmm. um, mentally and physically. So definitely get back on the bike. Uh, next four years, 2020 is definitely in the back of my mind, but I'm just going to let it sit there for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I've got a lot of life changing events happening now and, uh, yeah, so I'm just kind of going to live day to day and and not stress too much about it. You Mm -hmm. know, the past up to this point in my life has been all about sports. So at this moment, I'm just kind of wanting to 
be a bride almost, you know, and kind mm-hmm. of to just live the quotes normal life um and enjoy it yeah um you know not have a training program scheduling my days uh and months and weeks you know Mm -hmm. just kind of letting life live I like that and I mean I think everyone needs that every once in a while like your whole life has Absolutely. kind of been coming up to this like Olympic moment since wait, when you were like 13 and decided you wanted to do the yeah, Olympics. So exactly. And for me, it really, it really helps me um, taking moments like this to just not think about anything and see what pops into my mind, mm-hmm. see what my, what my heart desires. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, whether that is sport or I love culinary, whether it's going to culinary school. Yeah. You know, I just, I like to take a moment and let what I what I really want to do come through. That way, you know, it's, it's not a forced situation. Oh, I want to do this. Let's mm-hmm. do this. You know, then it's more of a passion. It's more of something you, you choose to do and you want to do. And uh, maybe you're meant to do. Yeah. So... I love yeah. that. I think that's very healthy. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. I awesome. think so too. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. Where can everybody follow along to see what is going to gonna be next for you? Where are you online? Um, yeah. So I have, uh, I have Facebook. Uh, obviously, I have um, just started an athlete page um, post-Olympics. And uh so you can follow along there with uh, kind of events that I'll be attending. Um, come see the medal if you can. And and then uh, I've got my personal Instagram that I kind of just share things that I love. And and uh, that's mmango 89 I believe. So, Perfect. Or well, just me and Mango Nalo. I'll make sure I, I link to that. I love your Instagram. It's Absolutely. awesome. Thanks. I'm not very good at it, but I try to be. (laughs) Oh, you're great. Whatever. (laughs) Awesome. Well, it was so much fun catching up again. Well, I'm going to have to find an excuse to do this again, too. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. All right. We'll do post, post, post Olympics. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well, enjoy your your many parades and banquets and award ceremonies and whatnot. (laughs) Yes, the high life. The high life. Awesome. Keep up. Thank Keep you, up. Mia. Yeah. And yeah, we'll Thank we'll you so soon. much. Hey guys, before you go, we just wanted to have one quick word from our sponsor, Health IQ. Health IQ is a life insurance company that helps the consummate athlete like you save money on your life insurance. To find out more, you can check out healthiq.com slash C A pod. That's C A P O D for all the details and to take a free quiz. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Consummate Athlete Podcast. To check out all of the show notes for this show, go to consummateathlete.com. And to follow along with our various adventures on the social medias, you can check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash consummateathlete or follow me, Molly Herford, at Molly J. Herford on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Peter Glassford on Twitter and Instagram. And if you could give us a huge favor and rate and review the podcast over on iTunes, that helps us bring on more guests, you know, get more episodes out and do more cool stuff. So we would be forever grateful. And if you're looking for coaching for endurance sport or just for health and wellness, uh, you can check out smartathlete.ca. And for amazing outdoor content, you can check out theoutdooredit.com. Aw, honey. And that's theoutdooredit.com for Molly Herford's writing and all things outdoors. All right. Thank you so much for listening, guys, and we'll see you next time.